In my first video on contemporary culture, I described the concept of alienation and its centrality in modern life. Modernity alienated Western culture from the conventions of Christianity, while postmodernity brings a plurality of ideologies together and thereby invalidates them. Our history is the observation of these developments. Nowhere else are they so apparent. And nowhere else is it so apparent than through the city. The city, taken as a whole, is an aggregation of art. The history of a city and the civilization responsible for it is represented by the differences of architectural styles and the periods they correspond to. For example, Tudor architecture is an architectural style that developed during the English Reformation and was largely influenced by the reappropriation of, arch of architectural elements taken from monasteries that were dismantled in that period. There are movements like Tudor revivalism, Gothic revivalism, Georgian revivalism, in which these styles taken from a previous era become revived, reinvented, and refined for a new age. So by looking at the city as a museum, it becomes an extension of art, an aggregation of art, as I have just said. I dedicated a whole video to this subject called Eyes on the City, Modern Art and Architecture. Very briefly to summarize, modern cities like New York uh, appear from a distance like a bed of nails. There is a superficial lack of a coherence, a lack of artistic convention. Whereas pre-modern cities are centralized around the ideological headquarters of society. The cathedral, the mosque, the temple centralizes and dominates the surrounding architecture. The surrounding architecture adheres to a uniformity, a convention. Pre-modern cities like Paris or Moscow or any old European city for that, matter, for that matter typically will section off modern skyscrapers from the heritage of the pre-modern convention. This is a physical manifestation of alienation, a manifestation of the separation I have been continually referring to in my explanation of modernity. In my video, What is Western Culture?, I define Western culture with the concept of alienation. Alienation from religion, alienation from any rigid ideological restrictions. The distance we create from ourselves through these examples of alienation allows for science and self-criticism. The self-criticism, this self-criticism connects our notion of Western culture with Enlightenment values, which surpass the limitations of religious ideology. As Western civilization is released from the all-encompassing cosmology of religion, it also becomes detached from the coherence provided by the mythology of religion and its anthropocentrism. Now, I've made this point before. I'm going to make it again because it is pertinent to this particular subject. The West used to be labeled Christendom. It used to be defined by the specific ideology that held dominion over it. Yet, in the modern world, it is defined as a spatial relation against the East. The West is the West because it is West of the East. This spatial relation is, again, an example of alienation. The West is not defined by Christianity. It is separated from Christianity, or any ideology for that matter. Understanding the developments from pre-modern to modern helps us understand what art is, generally speaking, what art does, why it is made, who is it made for. These questions are much more clear to us now that we have some historical contextualization. These questions are much more clear to us uh, when looking at pre-modern art. Now, taking the most cynical and dry point of view on the subject, it is clear when looking at pre-modern art that art both endorses the ideology of the society in which it is made, as well as instantiates the class the, and group affiliation of those who cultivate it, the patrons, the ruling class, or otherwise. This should be an obvious point, but when applied to the present day, it becomes less obvious. Most discussion regarding contemporary art has drifted into an esoteric jargon-filled discourse, uh, and therefore has no standard. Uh, there is no aesthetic standard, no moral standard, no consistent narrative in which it may adhere to. Without these standards, without a convention, there can be no connoisseurship. Without a connoisseurship, there can be no refinement. And, and that accounts for the nihilism of contemporary art, that accounts for the, the 
the plurality of different styles and, and, and aesthetic values that compete with each other in the contemporary art market. Contemporary art is organized by its commodity character. The fact that it can be sold is the unifying principle. Our notion of the art world is centered around the market in which it is bought and sold. Most people who care about contemporary art have some kind of vested interest in its commodity form. Now this is an enormous problem and one that I'll have to dive into in another video. For now, what is important to understand is that our notion of contemporary art does not correspond to our notion of pre-modern art, and that contemporary art does not provide the sense of collective membership in society. It does not provide a point of reference in which everyone uh, may adhere to. Pre-modern conventions totally envelop society in its aesthetic standards, in the same way um, as mass culture totally envelops postmodern society. Contemporary art mostly reflects on mass culture without giving much back into it. Contemporary art is mostly irrelevant to this larger role of collective membership, the role in which pre-modern art uh, was responsible for. So pre-modern art, in retrospect, could be seen as fulfilling both the role that contemporary art provides in instantiating the class status of the patrons who cultivate it, while also fulfilling the role that mass culture provides today in homogenizing the customs and norms of a general population. And the fact that we do not associate our notion of contemporary art with the ubiquitous presence of mass culture and entertainment is precisely why contemporary art is so enigmatic and frankly so irrelevant to the majority of people, educated people even. As I've discussed in previous videos, the Frankfurt School, building off of Marxist criticism, demonstrated how mass culture substitutes the conventions of pre-modern culture. We do not need to be bonded by metaphysical beliefs enshrined by the absolute authority of God. We are instead bonded together by pop culture. We observe and learn social norms through mass distribution of entertainment, despite however vacuous such content tends to be. The power of mass culture seems to always and inevitably be underestimated, and in a strange way, it is dismissed by almost everyone who enjoys it, yet it is incredibly powerful. Whether you're in Moscow in New York City, or New York City during Christmas time, there is no way to avoid listening to Mariah Carey or George Michael every hour on every other radio station. Uh, the global reach of mass culture and its homogenizing power outlines a new dominion of social norms made compatible with the uniformity of mass culture. Now, it's important to note here that globalism is not a new phenomena. If you went to 18th century Europe, you could sample the same style of classical music from the classical period. In, in Moscow, in Berlin, in London, in Vienna, and so on. And generally, it would sound similar throughout Europe. Now, as, you, as we move into the 19th century, music and art generally became more nationalistic. Like Tchaikovsky doesn't sound as Russian as his pupil, uh, Korsakov. Tchaikovsky sounds closer to Mozart than he does to Korsakov or uh, Mizorsky or Borodin. The globalism of the classical period was bonded together by the endorsement of an aristocratic class. Aristocratic authority rested upon classical aesthetic values. This nationalism that developed in the 19th century um, obviously followed a period, of, a revolutionary period in European history. The colonies broke off from England, there was the French Revolution, and a culmination of changes in the relation between the individual and society, the individual and government, and so on. This brings forth the dissolution of aristocratic authority, which by the end of World War I um, became almost entirely annihilated. But from the early 19th century, Western culture was well on its way with a new emergent class of working people leaving peasantry to become factory workers in cities. And the capitalist class that employed them um, was also fairly new. Part of, it was part of a new class of literate people who were not necessarily from an aristocratic bloodline. As more people participate in society, in the self-reflection of society, as more people became literate and became 
capable of articulating their perspective through art, through literature, journalism, and so on, a national identity became possible. The countryside of England, the peasantry of Prussia, all became part of the collective experience recorded through art. And as it materialized through art, it became part of the national identity. Now, this should be contrast. If you think of how monarchs throughout Europe were crossbred, the way that the Kaiser Wilhelm in Germany and Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, both being the, the nephew of, of or descendants of Queen Victoria of England. I mean, you could go on and on about the, the royal family trees and how they span Europe. This means that art made for the aristocracy is transnational. It adhered to classical values, uh, and, and within those classical values was authority. Um, classical culture holds within it an accumulation and refinement of art in which authority is instantiated with. Uh, for example, the aesthetic achievement of a cathedral is so powerful as a work of art in itself um, powerful as in awe-inspiring, as in perfect, this power, this authority must be claimed by the ruling class of society. It must belong to them if they are to be the ruling class. Hierarchy is signaled and organized through art. These classical aesthetic values in the history of Western art um, have some very important continuous features. I'm going to only to give one example in this video and, and end this video with this example because it's such a large subject that I could dedicate hours on. But I'm just going to share with you the, the classical Greek drawings on white lekythoi. These were funeral commemorations. Um, they showed uh, typically showed sleep and death carrying a, a corpse to the tomb and would later be a, a, appropriated to... Uh, in a funeral commemoration of, of a Greek soldier or, or a Roman soldier. And ultimately, this motif that I'm showing you here um, became the, the motif uh, in the deposition of Christ, you know, Christ descending from the cross. So it went from pagan to Christian while retaining many of the same uh, visual features. So this continuity transcends ideological changes in society, and with it carries the authority of Western culture um, and the, the powers, the hierarchy of Western culture repeatedly reaches back um, for these motifs, for these patterns in order to establish its own renewed legitimacy.